Well, good afternoon and welcome to SCL Competencies in a Remote Learning Environment. Today's topic is relationship skills. So we're excited to have you joining us for the Nyswanga Remote Learning Series. Sessions will provide educators opportunities to extend their learning and refine their practices in remote and or online learning. We will showcase high impact practices, model strategies, share resources, and highlight ways to facilitate effective remote learning. Although you will see that many of the strategies and resources we share are applicable in person in traditional learning settings as well. My name is Linda Stewart and presenting with me today is Brooke Drennan. We're both literacy coaches with the Rural Life Grant and we have been supporting schools in implementing personalized learning for the last two years. If you would like to access the materials from this session, go to the schedule registration page and everything we present here today will be there for you to look at. In today's, do I need to, to do that about the participant with the pair deck? Yes, so um, today's session is gonna be presented on pair deck and we will add a link to the resources document uh, that will actually allow you to work through that with the student paced version if you are not joining us live today. Thanks, Brooke. Friendship. Let's see what these students believe are the ingredients of a good friendship. Writing's not that easy, but Grammarly can help. This sentence is grammatically correct, but it's wordy and hard to read. It undermines the writer's message and the word choice is bland. So we're gonna make a bowl of soup. Wait, like a real bowl, bowl of soup? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, what we're making is friendship soup. Um, you know what friendship soup is? Uh, ingredients in soup. What's the ingredients in You're your mixing friend? together all of uh, your steps. So how do we make friendship soup? Uh, so you buy the jar at the store. I don't think friendship soup is something you can buy. Seriously? Seriously. We're going to make it right here. See this pot? Just tell me what to add. Okay. My recipe for friendship, I would use like two sticks of kindness. We probably have a probably a gallon of goofiness. Like three cups of having fun. Jealousy, you don't need barely any. You don't, you don't need any. Three pints of honesty and you stir them all together. How would you describe honesty? Honesty is just being honest to your friends, like not lying to be cool or like them. Just be yourself so um, they can like you for who you are. Does being honest lead to another ingredient? A teaspoon of arguments. Oh, that can get sticky. What goes well with that? Three tablespoons of um, respect. I would add one and a half cups of safety and a cup of trust. How would you explain trust? Trust is definitely something where like, I could go up to you and tell you something that I've never told anybody else and like trust you to be there for me. This is great. Let's write this down. Our recipe for friendship soup included two sticks of kindness, one gallon goofiness, 
three cups of having fun, three pints of honesty, one little teaspoon of those sticky arguments, three tablespoons of respect, one and a half cups safety, and one cup of trust. What ingredients have you been putting in your friendships? Uh, friendship is a relationship and all relationships require a few basic skills to thrive and that's what we're going to talk about today. Thanks Linda. So uh, if you've been joining us we're in um, the third part of our SEL learning series. Uh, so today we are focusing on relationship skills. Uh, we've gone over self-awareness self and self-management and next week we will uh, discuss social awareness. Um, and this is based on Castle's uh, five core competencies for social and emotional learning. So as you can see, uh, they're all connected there to um, being integrated in classrooms, schools, and homes and communities. Uh, like I said, in today's session, we're going to be focusing on relationship skills, and we'll discuss strategies for both building strong relationships with your students and teaching them the skills that they need to build those relationships with others. Uh, first, we have that strong focus on student-teacher relationships because we know that relationships are critical in the learning lives of students. In fact, the uh, relationship between a teacher and student uh, exerts a strong influence on achievement, an effect size of 0.52, according to Hattie, which is pretty large. And it, in addition to this, when we strive to build those relationships with students, we're modeling how they can do so with others, including their peers. And there are some skills we can model and help them practice explicitly, including those uh, communication and collaboration skills like relationship building, teamwork, and social engagement. And uh, the chart that you're seeing here comes from CASEL's uh, SEL Roadmap for Reopening Schools. Uh, it's, it's very current and relevant to what we are um, experiencing right now. And um, they have broken down those skills that we need now as we return to schools in uh, a moment of uncertainty. Uh, those relationship skills that are essential in helping us build and maintain meaningful connections uh, while we are working at a distance with many students and supporting them uh, through some of the struggles and griefs uh, that they are currently encountering and uh, collaborating to find uh, solutions to new obstacles. So let's watch this video that highlights how this school makes sure every student is known by at least one adult. Every student walks through the door wanting to feel valued. Every child deserves to have at least one adult in this building who knows them by name. We want 100% of our students to feel connected to a teacher in our building, and that's our goal. It was just a matter of how do we measure this? Early in the year, we conduct a teacher-student connection poster activity so that we can determine which students we've connected with and which students we need to work toward connecting with. Delaney is ordered to red food dye, yeah. and she also has a pond that she swims in. <laughs> we take their whole roster of students, we put it up on a wall, and we ask teachers to go through by name and face. Yep, I know this one, this one, this one. Can you all by name and face. Yep. I think that was a team goal by the end of the second week. What? Yeah. And a week two. The activity was based around how well do you know your students. Just through this simple, you know, adding a check mark next to the kid's name that you know, know by name and face, and then the other categories, academic status, and then a more in-depth personal story about them. Yeah. So that slips under the radar though. It's just pretty quiet. You look at a lot of kids and you go, hey, this student has one check mark. I know them by name and face, but other than that, I don't know where they're at academically. I don't know anything about their personal life. It's probably harder for them to feel valued in the learning environment without that connection to the teacher. So to me, that's what this is all about, a reflective process. How well are we getting to know our kids? And so you don't get to know 
those students. The stones in the river. That's a, I pick all of them. Right. Just letting the water wash over them. We got to go pick up that so, stone, turn it over. We want them to reflect. And then it's time to develop an action plan. What are we going to do to make sure that these students are taken care of? We have personal conversations with our students in the hallways during passing time. We also do things like um, thumbs up Thursdays uh, or feel good Fridays. And we just take a few seconds to have kids share things that they're proud of. To get to know the kids a little bit better on a personal level, just asking them a simple question as they come in the door. Example, last week I started off by just asking kids what their favorite food or fruit was. And then those questions can get deeper to try and get you know a little more personal. Winter. 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 Summer. Nice. The students here should be seen as people and not just pupils. The more valued they are for their individuality, the more successful they're going to be in the classroom, the more risks they're going to be willing to take. And that's, that's awesome. We have seen a huge increase in our students' connection to school with their connection to the teachers. And I think that's probably the most joy teachers have in their profession then the real work can begin. Relationship building with students has been shown to be instrumental in student success, but it may be one of the most underrated skills for educators today. Research has shown that more positive student-teacher relationships are associated with higher engagement, attendance, higher grades, and fewer disruptive behaviors. Feeling safe and comfortable can motivate students to continue logging on for class each day, and positive student-teacher relationships have huge academic benefits for our most vulnerable students. This means that focusing on relationships promotes equity in your classroom. The students who are most at risk, those who are racially, socially, or economically marginalized, or have learning disabilities, benefit the most from the quality of the relationships they form with teachers. And if you will look at the top right corner, there is a resource from the Harvard Relationship Map Mapping Strategy. It gives an explanation of relationship mapping strategy and resources for schools to put this strategy into action. So if schools actually wanted to come together like the teachers that we saw in the video um, and, and map the relationships that the adults in the building have with students, um, they could download uh, either the virtual strategy or the in-person strategy from this link and do that as a faculty, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, and I think as we're, you know, as we're navigating virtual learning, I think this, uh, the, that the relationships with our students, that's one, like one of the uh, biggest obstacles that we're seeing is how do we mimic those things that we're seeing in person, like the, uh, when they enter the room, the, the questions or, or the high fives and the greetings. So how can we, um, how can we mimic that in an online classroom? Um, we can't really replace it, um, but, but what could we do that could be um, a substitute for uh, the best case for now? Um, so that kind of segues into uh, what, what we were planning to talk about next, uh, which is um, making, how do we make sure that every student is known in a virtual setting? Um, so if you're interested, uh, there's a resource here um, linked to the top, Connecting with Reluctant Remote Learners. Uh, so there is an article with a strategy, I think it's a five-step strategy outlined uh, for connecting with those who we're not really seeing online or who are online but maybe are very reluctant to participate. So I'd be really interested in, in your ideas um, as, as participants um, how can we make sure that every student is known in a virtual setting? And through the Pear Deck, you can actually write your response and, and submit that so we could show some of the responses.
Brooke, I'm new to Pear Deck. I think I entered a comment. <laughs> um, yes, let's. That's showing what we did I'm earlier. Those. I know. Let's hide that one. And let's share this one. All right, so we have uh, lots of great ideas rolling in now. Um, at, at the start of class, uh, include those activities that are low stakes, that have students uh, share their info, like the questions, the teacher in the video. Um, I, I think that's a really great idea to, um, that is definitely something that we could continue to do. Uh, welcome each student by name as they come into the Zoom meeting or the Google Meet, just to uh, make that personal connection. Um, have one-on-one -on -one meetings with students or groups of students and text or email them to, pre to check on them frequently. Um, and if you review the Edutopia article that was linked to uh, the slide, uh, you may find some other um, strategies that you would like to use with your reluctant uh, remote learners. Hey Brooke, I'll add that for my son's school, they do a little 15 to 20 minute almost like a, an advisory group session in the morning. So all teachers have just a small group of students and they, um, it's, it's very low stakes. It's very much like a SEL driven top 20 minutes where it's really all about building relationships and checking in with every student. That was part of their brick and mortar uh, schedule as well. But I, I was glad to see that carry over even in this virtual space and maybe even more, especially in this, uh, digital space because it'd be easy for some kids just to never get talked to never be seen they never turn the camera on they never answer a question like there's even more isolated uh, than they would be in a, in a typical classroom well that sounds like a really effective way to continue those relationships with students and, and to build on those thanks for sharing that bethany Look, moving forward, uh, looking at our next resource, uh, we kind of highlight some of those challenges to SEL remote learning. So those challenges that are coming up as we are trying to learn virtually. Um, so if you click on the link at the top, and it's also on the resources page, there's a blog, three challenges to SEL, uh, to incorporating SEL into remote learning. Um, and you'll see the three challenges highlighted here, but each of them discussed within the blog, along with possible solutions. So what we'll do now is just take some time to read over the blog, to look at those challenges and the possible solutions. But I'd also like you to brainstorm some solutions that are working for you right now as well that you could share with others. Um, and then we'll add those as a response when, when we're finished.
So it looks like we have a few responses rolling in. Uh, looking at some of those obstacles or barriers to incorporating or promoting SEL during distance learning, uh, such as it's, it's difficult to have casual one-on-one -on -one conversations with small groups of students. Um, a possible solution might be using something like Google Classroom discussion thread um, for small group conversations, um, using Flipgrid for interactive discussions. Um, also um, looking at um, diminished teacher and student presence, uh, we could um, make sure that there are ways for students to participate. I really like the use of something like Pear Deck or even something like Poll Everywhere or Nearpod that just encourages all students to participate. Uh, even those who might be reluctant to unmute and speak up. Uh, would anyone else feel comfortable sharing some ideas that you have right now? I'll share because it's quicker than typing. Okay. <laughs> um, I think one strategy that I've heard about is with Zoom, I know a lot of schools, you know, maybe they would have a, in a typical, you know, brick and mortar type schedule, they might be in a class for, let's say 55 or 60 minutes. That's a long time to keep a kiddo on a Zoom call. So they might do, you know, 25 to 30 minutes on Zoom and then students know that this subgroup of students stays on after Monday's class and this group of students stays in on after Tuesday's class. And so there's like a small group rotation and the teacher can swap out the, the groups each week or based on different needs or whatever, all sorts of different ways you could, could schedule that. but that would create a space for some smaller groups where you might feel more comfortable having some of the discussions that we feel like we're missing when there's 25 or 30 faces looking at us uh, on Zoom or whatever platform we're using, Google Meet. Definitely uh, the, just using small groups and, and being flexible with how you schedule that time and not having the entire class get on for that entire block, I think uh, is something that teachers are finding really effective for being able to connect with students on a much more personal level. Uh, do we have any other ideas that we'd like to share, either that came up in the blog or um, that you just personally are finding success with? I read somewhere, um, it might have been a session that Verizon was hosting um, about back called back channeling apps um, that teachers can use. Uh, today's Meet used to be a back channeling app. I don't think it exists anymore, but something similar to uh, I think what you somebody mentioned here on the on the Pear Deck about uh, discussion threads. But I think there are a variety of platforms and tools out there for that that type of modality. Yeah, I think I've used something like back channel chat before or something like that. Um, I can't remember the exact website, but um, that would definitely be an option as well. All right, and so this is actually an SEL uh, template that I pulled from Pear Deck. So they just suggest a, a strategy, just uh, polling students. You should be seeing on your screen right now the option to share, and I should have uh, sent this out earlier before I asked people to share. Um, but do you feel comfortable sharing your thoughts out loud right now? It sends out a multiple choice response to students. And that way uh, you can call on those who may feel comfortable, but may not like be that willing to speak up if you just say, who wants to answer this question? Uh, but you, if, if Linda said, uh, yes, I feel comfortable if she responded to that in, in the poll, um, I'm feeling nervous, but I think I could do it. I might encourage her and call her out. So as the teacher, I can see who has uh, responded by name. And so I could say, oh, well, Linda's feeling um, like she might be willing to share. So I'm going to prod her a little bit and encourage her. So that's just a really quick way to see who feels comfortable to share their thoughts. And you might find willingness from students who don't normally raise their hands. Um, so I liked that idea for getting um, more uh, student presence on our virtual meetings. Communication when trying to build relationship skills is, 
is sometimes difficult and sometimes students and adults uh, need help developing and refining these skills. So this activity helps students establish common dialogue and everyone is, that everyone is comfortable with while also supporting understanding social changes and diction. It should support norms for dialogue within collaboration, but can be referenced later in developing writing skills for varying audiences. To get started, please click the link in the, in the upper right corner. And this is also included as a link on the resources document that you'll find mm -hmm. on the website. Um, if you would be interested in sharing this with your students. Thanks. Uh, it's a stepping up to dialogue graphic organizer. And as you can see across the top, it has different, the little pictures are not showing it has different um, modalities for you to be able to to answer a question or to get uh, sentence starters to answer questions or and you could do this together as a class um, in order to establish norms for your class into how you want responses to be given sort of like accountable talk type thing and if you will look, you can see the situation is on the left. And as you go down this, the screen, there are several different types of situations. And then if you were in that situation, what would you text to someone uh, about that situation? And then just one-on-one -on -one with, uh, with, with friends, a conversation with a friend, how would you respond if that were the case? And the last one, peer-to-peer -peer dialogue in, in, in groups or in class. So the first one is you don't understand what they are saying. So if you were texting that to a friend that was in this class with you, a question mark would, would do the trick, I think. And it would let your, your friend know, hey, that, I don't know what, what, what was just done there. In a conversation with a friend, you might say, what are, what are you talking about? Or what do you mean? And then with the group, it would be like, I got confused when you said what the sky's blue. Can you explain that again? So it just gives a, a way for students to safely speak out in texting with a friend or with peers um, and just sets norms for the class of how you want things to be, to go or to be done. Uh, the next one was you agree and want to add more to it, okay? So in texting, you might just say, feel the same or maybe even a thumbs up. You might, uh, in a conversation said, me too, or also, and add a little bit more to it, and if you're talking with your peers, I'd like to, I'd like to know more about, I'd like to, I can't say that. I'd like to echo what whoever was talking about. So it's, it's, it's just a good way for a class to come together or an individual teacher to, to do or a group of teachers to come together and decide on what would be the best way to respond in those varying situations and I yeah I think that you could share this as a Google Doc and you could give editing privileges to anyone who has the link and so then uh, students could fill that out together as a group you could share it individually and students could fill this out individually um, but it's just really modeling those ways that we communicate with others. And then uh, as a former high school teacher, I could uh, imagine using this and talking about the difference between uh, how we respond to someone when we're texting or how we talk with our friends versus how we might talk uh, with an employer 
or how we might talk with a professor. So really looking at those uh, relationship skills that we kind of take for granted that we think students should, uh, should know already and just really focusing in on some strategies that they can use to communicate more effectively with others. And we are running a little short on time, so we'll show you just one more communication strategy that you could work on with students. Um, active listening is a really uh, key skill that uh, students need for good communication skills. And we know sometimes that that can be a struggle, uh, like Linda said, for students and adults. Um, so just sharing with them some skills that they can use to be active listeners, such as giving their full attention, asking questions, avoiding distractions, and really thinking about ways that you could do this online as well. So making sure that you're not get, getting distracted on your uh, 20 other tabs that you have open or your notifications and just really being present and alert uh, with the speaker. So looking at the screen um, and as teachers modeling that um, by making sure that you're looking into the camera, uh, which can be a little tricky uh, because I know sometimes when others are speaking, I look away or I might look down at what what I'm going to be doing next or something like that, but really modeling that and listening intently as as students are speaking as well. So there's another um, another strategy or another activity that we had built in uh, with Pear Deck. And I, this was another template that was all ready to go. So you could just give students um, a prompt to discuss, to either agree or disagree. Uh, ideally, you would relate that to your day's lesson or something that they've been reading or a text that you just gave them to read. Um, I put something really simple up here, snow is better than sand. And then you can drag your dots to agree or disagree with that. So we have some polar opposites in the room. So then we could pair them up either using something like a Zoom room. Um, I've also seen some ideas for turn and talk um, alternatives such as having a phone buddy uh, that, that students know uh, is their turn and talk buddy. So they actually have phone number so that they could call and talk with one another. Um, even ask students to try this activity out if they did have, if you're working with younger students, maybe they do have an adult in the room with them. They could practice that with, with um, a person who is there in the home, just put themselves on mute and try this out. So they would, you would give them a few minutes to brainstorm their perspective and then share it to their partners. Um, have the partners repeat back what they said, how accurate were they, and really practice and hone in on those active listening skills. So that's just another way that we can help students um, be better communicators and reinforce some of those relationship skills that are really important uh, in having effective um, relationships with, with peers, with teachers, with family members, and in others. So that's going to wrap up uh, today's session on relationship skills and incorporating that into your virtual instruction. Um, I'd like you to take a second and just reflect on something valuable that you're taking away today. Maybe an idea uh, that you're excited to, to put into practice or just a reminder that, that you received as a result of the things that the activities and the things that we read. And then also, how do you envision implementing or sharing what you learned with others? Um, so this is a draw anywhere slide. Um, you could, you're seeing, probably seeing the options for markers and highlighters and things like that. You can also insert a text box if you're not an artist. I know I always prefer text to, to drawing. So you could do that as well, um, just to share some of your um, major takeaways. And then I'll see those responses is if you're doing the student paced version um, and maybe we'll share some of those in a future session.
I tried the drawing, but then went to the text box. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you said that, Brooke, because I hadn't noticed that as an option. <laughs> I think the text box would be really difficult for me on here. So, um, also, you're seeing some of our, we did a little practice run through, so you're seeing <laughs> silly things. <laughs> Full transparency, um, I do not know how to delete that. So that would be something to definitely learn before using with students. All right, so uh, I hope that you have a couple of things that you're taking away today, ways in which you can uh, build those relationships with students virtually. I've, even though the distance makes that a little more difficult and a little more challenging, um, just coming up with some creative ways in which you can kind of bridge that distance. Uh, is there any uh, last thoughts? Are there any last thoughts that uh, either of you would like to share today? I don't have any. Thank you, Brooke. All right. And um, we like to remember that uh, teachers who put relationships first don't just have students for one year. They have students who view them as their teacher for life. And we all know that that's why we're in this profession to build those lasting relationships and to have an effect on students. So I hope that you can find a way to continue to do that. And uh, if you wouldn't mind just to take our um, survey and that's gonna allow us to reflect on your thoughts about the session. Uh, we're always looking for ways to improve, so we would appreciate that. Thank you.